So here we have a electrostatics question. We are told that we have a small isolated sphere A with a mass of 0.2 grams. Okay, so this one has a mass of 0.2 grams, carrying a charge of 7 times 10 to the minus 9 is suspended from a, from a horizontal surface. Okay, by a string, a second sphere carrying a charge of blah, 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 on an isolated stand attracts sphere A so that the strings form an angle of 20. The horizontal distance between them is 3 centimeters. Okay, so the first question says, state Coulomb's law in words. So before we get into the definition, I always like to show you guys the formula, because from the formula, it can help you to remember the definition, because sometimes you're sitting in an exam, and you might hit a blank, you know, but if you write out the formula, it can remind you. So I went and got this from the formula sheet, so there it is. So what I want you to see now is that um, there is charges that are being multiplied together, so that's called a product. Now this R is at the bottom, and these two are at the top. So when the, so if I want you to look at the F, and I want you to look at everything at the top, everything that's at the, uh, well how can I say this? Mm, okay, so when these are at the top and these are at the top, then we call that directly proportional. When this one's at the top and this one's at the bottom, we call that inversely proportional. Now I'm gonna go get the definition and you'll see what I'm talking about. There is a relationship between the definition and the formula. So here we have it. The magnitude of the force, okay, is of the electrostatic force between two charges is directly proportional to the product of the charges, there they are, and inversely proportional to the square, because it's got a square, of the distance between them. Pretty cool, hey? So there's our definition. Next question. Draw a vector diagram of the forces acting on sphere A indicate at least one angle. Okay, now why are they telling us to indicate at least one angle? That, that sounds scary. I don't know about you, but that sounds weird, eh? Anyways, let's see what we can do. All right, so when they say vector diagram, by the way, we didn't even pause there. That was pretty awkward, eh? Vector diagram, like what is that? Guys, when they say vector diagram, I don't know. It's pretty random. You don't really see it too much, but you can think of it as free body diagram. Okay, so we'll just do free body diagram. So, force charge A. Now, charge A, they told us, has mass. Anything that has mass would also have gravity acting on it. So that would be our first one we can put there, saying gravity. And then, of course, we've got these two guys over here, so charge A and charge B. They are obviously charges, so the one's positive, the one's negative. Um, if they were both positive, it doesn't really matter. The, f the, the point is, is when you have two charges, they are going to exert a force on each other, and that's this whole Coulomb's force, or electrostatic force. Now, you've got to think about it carefully. So we, we, we're doing a free body diagram on A. So we want to know what is what forces are acting on A. So what would B do to A? Well, they ne the one's negative and the one's positive. So they are going to attract. So my question to you is, what is B going to do to A? Well, B is going to pull A to the right. No, but Kevin, A is going to pull B to the left. Yes, that's also correct, but we're not looking at B. We're looking at A. The free body diagram is on A. So we're going to draw an arrow going that way. Or we can just say that this is an electrostatic force, just like that. Now, what other forces are there? Well, the only other force is this little arrow. <laughs> this little arrow. This rope. This rope, okay? Now, what is that rope doing? Well, think about it carefully. A rope can't push. Try push someone with a rope and let me know how that goes. It doesn't work, right? A rope can only pull. So it's going to pull in that direction over there. So we can do that. Right. Now we can say that that's a tension force, like that. Now, that would technically be done for a free body diagram, but they did say indicate at least one angle. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, what you don't want to do is go put the 20 over there, because that's not correct. I'll show you what I mean. If we're to use, do the, whoa, Kevin, if we're to go like this, then this is 20, so then this is 20, just because of alternating angles. So what I can do is I can draw a dotted line going up here. If I could uh, go straight, that would also help. Don't know what's wrong with me today. So I do a dotted line going up like that. 
and then I could put 20 degrees like that. And there we've done it. They did say show at least one angle, so we've shown at least one angle. All right, so I've just brought this, this um, free body diagram over because we might need to use it now. So it says calculate the magnitude of the electrostatic force that B exerts on A. Okay, no, we don't need anything. We don't need the free body diagram. So this sometimes confuses learners. They're saying calculate the magnitude of the electrostatic force that B exerts on A. Now, because of our good old friend Newton, what he discovered was that in Newton's third law, the, the force of B on A or A on B is exactly the same. So they're actually just asking you to calculate the force between these two. Now, how do we do that? Well, we just use Newton's, not Newton's, um, Coulomb's law, because that is the formula to calculate the force between two charges. And they're saying here, the electrostatic force. So here we have the formula over here, and we also have the value of k. So we can just go fill it in now. So we can just go f equals, now k is a constant given to us on our formula sheet as nine times 10 to the nine. Q1 would be the charge of one, which is, we can say that one for example, so that's seven times 10 to the minus nine. Q2 would be this one, but remember when we use this formula, we don't use the negatives um, that you see in the front there. We don't use the negatives. We only use the charges themselves. And then the distance, be careful guys, that needs to be in meters. Kevin, how am I supposed to remember what units I'm supposed to use? Good question, but it's quite easy. I'll show you a little trick. What you do is you look at the formula and you look at the constant. Now the constant is K. So then you go to K and you look at all of its units. Look at that, there's an M. See, there's not a centimeter, it's only a M for meter. So that means we're gonna use meters. Uh, Kevin, how do we get from centimeters to meters? I hear you awkwardly asking me. It's okay, we all forget these things from time to time. Uh, so you are just going to um, divide by 100. So you're gonna divide by 100. So that means three centimeters will be 0, 0,03 meters. So we'll say 0, 0,03, and then we're gonna square that over there. Go ahead, type this all in on your calculator, and you get an answer of 5.6 times 10 to the negative four, and that would simply be in Newtons. And the last question, calculate the magnitude of the tension force in the string. Now this is actually very easy. I'll show you guys the way it works. We know that this object A cannot move, right? We know that it, um, it's not moving, so it is in equilibrium. When something is in equilibrium, it means that all of the forces acting to the left must be the same as all of the forces to the right. So all forces acting left must be the same as all forces acting to the right. Okay, it also means that all forces acting up must equal all forces acting down. Okay, that is just basic equilibrium. So what we can do, we already calculated this force over here earlier as 5.6 times 10 to the negative four. So what we could then do is we could say that this 5.6 times 10 to the negative four must be the same as all of the forces going to the left. Now, some of you are like, Kevin, there are no forces going to the left, bro. Yeah, I hear you, but remember that this FT, this tension force, um, it's, not, it's, it's got a little bit of a left and it's got a little bit of an up. That's how it goes in this direction. So it's got a little bit of a left and it's got a little bit of an up. So what we'll do is we will break it up into its components and then we have something to work with. So what I would do here is I would work out this little angle as 70 degrees. That's easy, right? Because that's 90. So if this one's 20, then this one's 70. Okay, then uh, I'm gonna put the FT over here. Now what you do is you use trigonometry. So you could make a little triangle for yourself over here. Okay, and if I had to enlarge that triangle for us a little bit, we've got a horizontal, um, we've got a vertical, and we've got FT. 
and we've got this as 70 degrees. So we use trigonometry like sin, cos, tan, and what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to find this ft in the x direction. So we are looking for the adjacent, and we have, well, we have the letter for the hypotenuse. So what we can do, that'll be cos. So we could say that cos 70 is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Then if we had to get the adjacent by itself, we would end up getting ft cos 70. So what we can now do is, let's go back to our little free body diagram that we had from earlier. So earlier on we had it as ft, but now um, I've broken that ft up into its horizontal, and then if I wanted to, which I don't, but if I wanted to, if I needed to, I could have also worked out its um, vertical component like that. So now I can actually say that these two must be equal to each other. Because if it wasn't, then the object would literally start moving left or moving right. But it's not moving, so it, those two forces must be equal. So what I can say then is that the F, the tension force in the X direction must be the same as the electrostatic force. You can also, if you wanted to, say that this one must be the same as this one. But then you're going to have to go do a few more calculations and you're going to have to go get the gravitational force, which is not difficult. You can do it that way. And on the memo, they have different ways, and that's why we have different answers. Um, some of the answers are quite different, which is weird, but hey, it is what it is. So what we can then do is say Ft cos 70. See, because that's what Ftx was, right? That's what we said over here. And we can make that equal to Fe, which we calculated earlier, as 5.6 times 10 to the negative 4. Then to get the tension force by itself, I can just say 5.6 times 10 to the negative 4 divided by cos 70, and that's going to give us a tension force of 1.64 times 10 to the negative 3 newtons. And I don't need to give a direction because they just said magnitude. So to get these answers, um, there's obviously different ways we could have done this question. You could have maybe said that the tension force in the Y must be the same as gravity. That would have also worked, but it might have given you a different answer. So yeah, those are the different options. So there we have it.